see. Uh, oh, hi. Um, this is a small disclaimer. The video was posted three days ago and we took it down because after putting it up on YouTube, we discovered that one of the things I had said in there, I had misspoken. Anytime you hear me say the name Eli Whitney Blake, just replace that with Eli Whitney III, not Eli Whitney Blake. Thank you. Smells like Manifest Destiny. the Colt Walker. In this case, it's actually a Colt Walker. This is a Colt second generation black box Walker. It's about as close to a real Walker as most of us are ever gonna get. This was made in 1978, and uh, let's take a few shots with it. Go for the uh, And a common problem, floating lever coming down. All right, look for this water bottle here. You might as well just get used to putting that loading lever up after every shot. And not hitting. Nope, good. Yep. And collect. All right, only five, only five for safety. All right, let's talk about it. This, as the people at Rock Island Auction would say, is the gun that gave Colt the keys to the mint. Is it a good gun? Probably not. Is it definitely not the best he ever came up with? Is it uh, reliable? Kind of. Is it powerful? Oh yeah, it's powerful. Is it the most powerful? I don't think so. And a lot of people will give me flack for that, but there are several guns, even back in as early as 1851, that could have matched this gun. Everybody wants a Walker because it's very powerful, and in, in America, it's considered the most powerful revolver until the 357 came along in the 1930s, and I'm, I'm not for sure that's true. But it is very powerful, especially when compared to the other guns of the day, the other revolvers which there was one. <laughs> okay, so we know that Sam Colt started a business, Patterson, New Jersey, had a five-shot revolver known as the Patterson Revolver, and you've seen that video, and that he made some cells into Florida, into the Army, and that he uh, made a few sales in Texas to the Texas Rangers. But overall, by 1842, he uh, went out of business because it didn't sell enough. It was too fragile. You had to take the gun apart to load it. Too small. Um, just really wasn't all that. People weren't all that into it, except the Texas Rangers and John Coffey Hayes, who used it to great effect against the uh, Comanches. But wasn't enough to keep Cold afloat. He went out of business, and he went back to doing what he did best. Underwater mines, remember that whole raft thing of him being a kid and getting everybody covered in mud and water? Well, now he went to a big scale. He took the uh, the idea, and along with Samuel Morris, the inventor of Morse code, 
developed an underwater mine that fired off of an electrical charge through a wire, just like Morse code. He did have an exhibition where he blew up a five-ton ship. And he was getting a little attention for that, but really, as he would say, he was living hand-to-mouth, didn't know where the next meal was going to come from. But our story today isn't so much about Samuel Colt as it is about a young man named Captain Samuel Walker. Now, Captain Samuel Walker was a uh, rich kid, grew up on a plantation in the south. By the time of the Battle of San Jacinto, he was, he was a young man, and uh, he had the fire in him to head down to Texas to uh, join the Texans, because after Texas independence, Mexico kept trying to come back for the next 10 years over and over and over again and take back Texas from Mexico to Mexico to themselves. Anyway... Walker winds up down there with a group of men fighting um, the Mexican army and he gets captured and would later be involved in what was known as the Black Bean episode. Now what happened was they were captured, they were taken down to uh, Mexico City where him and a group of other Texans were put in prison and were treated horribly. And uh, it just so happens on February 11th of 1843, him and 176 other men managed to escape. Now, they weren't rampaging their way through Mexico or anything else. They were just trying to get home when they were captured by Santa Ana's men. And uh, it became famous as the Black Bean episode because Santa Ana ordered that all 176 be executed. Well, the man in charge, the Mexican general, felt that this was something that the officers should take blame for and so he declared that only um, one out of every ten men would be executed and the way that they would decide who would be executed and who would live was they would have a jar of white beans and in that jar would be 17 black beans now feeling that the officers should take um, the officers in this unit should take uh, responsibility for this escape He supposedly, this is legend, he supposedly put all the black beans on the top of the jar and made the officers draw first. And it's well recorded that these men were very brave, blindfolded, drawing these beans. And of course, most of the officers drew the beans first and they were killed. Now later on, Santa Ana, this happened on March 25th. About a month later, Santa Ana killed a bunch of the other ones anyway because that was his original intention was to kill all of them. But out of all this... Sam Walker lived, and he developed, you might call, a hatred for the Mexican government and Mexican soldiers. Many of the Texans developed this hatred. Not only had they been through the massacre at the Alamo, and they'd all heard about it, and they'd, it was a great patriotic story, but they'd learned to hate the Mexican army. Right after that, uh, they had the Mexican army had massacred the Texans at a town called Goliad. And now you have this black bean episode where they're still executing prisoners. And the Texans and the Texas Rangers especially would, for years and years, harbor these really hard feelings towards the Mexicans. That's why a lot of people now call the Texas Rangers and the things that happened in the Mexican-American War very racist. Well, they were just responding to things that had happened before. Well, he gets back. He gets back from Mexico. And he joins up with Captain Jack Hayes. And for the next three years, fights with Jack Hayes, where he gets well acquainted with the Patterson Revolver, Colt's Patterson Revolver. Jack Hayes loves that thing. But he also notices the shortcomings of the Patterson Revolver. One of the things that Walker did not particularly care for in the Patterson Revolver was the fact that it was so underpowered compared to the heavy dragoon single lock flint single shot flintlock of the time which was a 62 caliber and even what would come later as the Aston revol- or not revolver the Aston pistol which was a 54 caliber for 3 years he rides with Jack Hayes suddenly After all these years of America not taking any interest in Mexico or Texas, James Polk's in office. Something called Manifest Destiny is sweeping the nation. The idea that Americans should 
have the whole continent, sea to sea, because all these other countries, France, who'd had it before, part of it, Spain, and they were doing absolutely nothing with it. And uh, the Americans were moving west all the time. Uh, Americans had been down in Texas since before, of course, the, uh, the war for Texas independence. And by 1846, there's real tension between Texas, Mexico, and America. Of course, America and Texas being on the same side. America annexes Texas, and which the Mexicans don't really mind. But what they mind is the when America annexed Texas, they declared the border at the Rio Grande. Now, Mexico had always stated that the Nueces River was the border between Texas and Mexico. And so, long story short, Zachary Taylor, who was not president at the time, he was in charge of a big chunk of the American army, just went south of the Nueces River and set up on the Rio Grande. Mexicans didn't like that. It resulted in a firefight and a big fight in Congress as to whether or not America should go to war with Mexico. And of all people, the one person who was the most anti-war was a guy named Abraham Lincoln, who was forever known after that as Spotty Lincoln. Look up why they would call him Spotty Lincoln. It's a hilarious story, but uh, it's uh, it seems like he didn't like war until he became president, and then war was fine. Time goes on. Walker writes a letter. He wants to make some more Colt Pattersons. Because they're, they're breaking down, they're, you know, after eight years of service or so, they're, uh, they're not the best revolvers out there to begin with, and they're pretty fragile. And uh, he, he goes and he writes a letter. He goes to New York, writes a letter to Samuel Colt, requesting that he send them more of these Patterson revolvers with a few minor changes. Now, evidently, he didn't read the local newspaper in 1842 that had said that um, Colt's been out of business for six years. He's kind of living hand to mouth. He, <laughs> he has no machinery. He can't even get his hands on one of his own original guns because he sold them all. And uh, as a matter of fact, he had to go around asking for a loan of one so that he could copy it. But does that d deter Sam Colt? We know Sam Colt. He's a... Uh, He's a shrewd businessman. Sometimes he's even a little bit, uh, shall we say, unethical. And uh, when he receives this letter, he writes back, Sure, I'll be more than glad to make a thousand pistols for the United States government to be designed by Samuel Walker. Well, Samuel Walker's thrilled. The very first thing he writes back, and he gets this through Congress even, that he wants this pistol to be of... 45 caliber 50 bore and uh he needs it to have a nine inch barrel um the lo it needs to the loading lever needs to be on it but that wasn't his design that was colt's idea he actually the original design was more like the patterson with no loading lever but another thing was he hated how high the patterson shot so he wanted instead of this patterson bead front sight he said he wants this front sight, which is more of a sloped uh, long sight. Well, Colt's ready to make them. Of course, he has no machinery, doesn't even have a blueprint, doesn't even have a gun. But he's already agreed to a contract with the United States government to get them made. So what does he do? He runs across town to the nearest guy with a machine shop, and that would be Eli Whitney Jr., the son of the famous Eli Whitney who invented the cotton gin. But uh, he has a machine shop, and as a matter of fact, he's been turning out the 1841 Mississippi rifle for the United States government. So, Colt gets a loan from the government to buy the machinery he would need to make these guns. Well, it's not a loan, it's basically payment up front. But he still doesn't have the men to do it, and he doesn't have the place, and he still, like I said, he still doesn't even have the machinery he once had. So he goes to Eli Whitney Blake, who is not supposed to be making revolvers. He's supposed to be making the 1841 Mississippi rifle. He talks Whitney into it with the agreement that Whitney will take two-thirds 
of the money made, which would be basically Colt makes eight dollars off of every water, and um, Whitney would make twenty dollars. And there's a little bit of play in there because of there. I'll tell you about it in a minute. Flasks, but he adds the loading lever, which was on his design. He'd put it on a few Pattersons. He really gets to moving by January fourth of. 1847 and he actually has the machining set up purchased and at Whitney's shop by January the 10th he winds up making these pistols in six months which was unheard of the first batch of pistols is ready by June and that's the first 200 and of course the military wants to test them but he writes Samuel Walker and says, Oh, no, no, we can't let the military start testing these things. We'll never get them there. Which is probably a good thing that the military didn't test them. Because if they had, this thing would have never got to the front. Because it had some issues. Number one issue being, the original contract with the government calls for, and this is something that I found in Haven Belden's uh, The History of the repeating Colt, their Colt's repeating revolver. The original contract calls for a wrought iron frame, but cast steel barrel and cylinder. Now a lot of people will say these guns are completely made of iron. Now maybe at some point he changed it, I don't know, but the original contract says cast steel barrel and cylinder, wrought iron frame, iron grip frame. One of the very first troubles that Samuel Colt runs into is these frames and getting them forged for the grip. And he writes Congress and he says, can I take and change this to brass because it's easier to form and I'll get it done in time. Well, they agree with that. And so by basically June of 1847, Walker has a good chunk of these guns ready to go. One man would have two revolvers. So they paid for a thousand guns, but they also paid for a thousand flasks and a thousand tools. Colt kind of pocketed that money and really only made uh, 500 flasks and 500 tools because, and it makes sense, because there would only be one flask and one loading tool for poor man, but the government decided, no, 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 we've paid for a thousand flasks, we want a thousand flasks. Now this was going to put Colt way behind, so it took about three months of communication back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Until Walker, who was thoroughly frustrated with the situation, said, I'll pay for the flask myself if I can only get these guns down here to Mexico. Eventually, this issue was worked out, and Samuel Colt got the flasks made. He got 500 flasks, 1,000 guns, shipped to Mexico, and two special guns were given to Samuel Walker ahead of time. Now, all this time, the government doesn't know that Eli Whitney Blake is making these revolvers. There are letters where Samuel Colt writes to Walker and says, we've got to hurry up and get this powder flask thing settled so I can get these shipped out because if the government finds out that they're paying their own guy to make these guns and paying me, they're going to have a fit. And uh, somehow it all worked out because the guns got there. Now, all of, after all of the uh, talking and the fighting and the infighting and about the uh, flasks, the Walkers finally arrive in Veracruz in October of 1847. Now, the trouble was, um, Walker's company, the Texas Rangers, moved out of Veracruz about two days before the revolvers got there. So the only revolvers, when the big fighting happened down there, the only revolvers that were in hand were Samuel Walker's own revolvers. And there are some great stories, I don't know if they're all true or not, about how Samuel Walker charged a battery of cannon and basically killed all the men with his pistols, didn't have any fuses, turned the cannon around to fight the Mexicans, did not have fuses for the cannons, so he fired blanks from his walkers into the breach of the cannons and fired them. But as the day's fighting wore on, he was fighting from a doorway, concealment, using his walker pistols. 
What happened was he was shot by a Lancer. And the Lancer was using an Escobar musket and then Sam Walker died. And what happened then was his company of men went crazy and committed some war crimes and basically destroyed the town that they were fighting in. But it's also famously known Sam Walker died with his pistols in his hands. By this time, Colt uh, had already got another thousand gun contract and uh, he basically broke up with Eli Whitney Blake in a big um, legal fight and somehow managed to wind up with all of the machinery and equipment to make these big guns. And he took off for Connecticut where he would set up his own factory. First time he would have something really solid to work with as a revolver in his own name, doing it himself. And he kept government contracts. Meanwhile, the Texas Rangers down in Mexico got their hands on the rest of those Colts. The rest of those walkers that were in Veracruz. And they made quite a name for themselves, to put it nicely. After the uh, death of their captain, they became known as the Tejanos Diablos, the Devil Texans. Because anytime basically an American troop would get killed, there was vengeance taken out on the Mexican people in Mexico City, and they did it with these walkers. As a matter of fact, they say one night it sounded like the 4th of July fireworks, how many of these walkers were going off. And they went through downtown Mexico City and just cleaned out a lot of people that they thought were involved with killing American troops. And there were never any Americans killed in the Mexican-American War after that or in the uh, occupying territories. But uh, that really set some bad blood between the Mexicans and the Texas Rangers. It was so bad that um, Winfield Scott, who was in charge of the whole thing down there, eventually had to send the Texas Rangers home because he could not control the Mexican population as long as the, um, he thought, as long as the Texas Rangers were there. Anyway, this gun, the Colt Walker, came back to America, came back to Texas where it served with the Texas Rangers. As a matter of fact, they were to turn them all in in 1848, but, um, something happened they were supposed to turn all these walkers in for better guns out of 1,000 walkers that were made for the u.s military i mean well the texas rangers the mounted rifles only 87 of them came back working and they what, what the story was was they well they all exploded well a lot of them did explode that's that's famously documented but i don't think that over 900 of them exploded if you ask me, there was uh, probably a few boating accidents on the way back from Mexico or something, and you'll see pictures of these in Texas Rangers holsters all the way up until the 1870s. They love these guns. And uh, had 900 out of 1,000 of these exploded or been completely rendered useless, I don't think that the Texas Rangers would ever have been revolver men that would have really basically set up Colt for years to come with Texas ordering revolvers all the time. They would have hated these things. But uh, no, surprisingly for um, over 900 of these things being non-functional, uh, it was always still a pretty popular revolver. Now, let's talk about this Colt second generation revolver. It's not a hopped up Uberti. And I say that because if you want to know about these go to Mike Bellevue's videos okay he has videos on the first second and third generation Colts this is a second generation Colt the um, last Colt to sell at Rock Island auction I believe the last Walker was the uh, Danish sea captain Walker that brought over a million point eight dollars so these are expensive but uh, this is as close you're gonna get to a real Colt without paying that kind of money so it's also the smoothest Captain Ball revolver action I have ever felt right out of the box. It's really a great gun. Let's shoot it some more. All right, well, the compadres are over there reloading that thing. The Walker could hold up to 60 grains of black powder, and that's probably where a lot of those explosions happened. If they did happen, that's probably what caused it. It was really meant to be loaded with 50 grains, and that's what we're shooting today, 
50 grains of black powder. That's what Colt said to load it with. This gun is often touted as the most powerful revolver up until the 1930s and the invention of the 357 Magnum. If you're shooting 60 grains in a round ball, that, that's possible. But if you're shooting 50 grains, which a lot of people did, and a lot of people do, it's it's not. It really isn't because you're going to find that um, the Aston, uh, even the cap lock uh, single shot pistol of the time, 54 caliber, you could load 60 grains in it and you'd be just fine. It was a smooth bore, but it also had a lot heavier round and, uh, you know, it really could have just been more powerful. And you could say, well, that's because it's a single shot. It's the most powerful revolver. Well, the Adams Beaumont came out in 1851 in London, and it was a 50 caliber. Now, I don't know exactly how much um, they loaded in it, but it could very well have been loaded to the same uh, capacity and been more powerful. And then in the 1870s, the Gasser revolver came out, and that thing was even more powerful yet. Uh, it could shoot a rifle round. When it finally was converted to cartridges, they, what was the name? What was that cartridge it would shoot? The the Verndal is a 11 point. I think it's 11.5. I'll have to look it up. I'll put it right here. But yeah, they would they could shoot carbine cartridges, but they actually had a special cartridge made just for that pistol, so you didn't like break your wrist every time you shot it. So yeah, it's there have been pistols, production pistols all through that time that could have been more powerful than the Walker. Well, here's the sunny slopes long ago. Thanks for watching. Hi. Ramrod. Don't talk. Don't talk. Oh.
Man, it's amazing what happens when you put powder behind the ball.